there, and welcome back to Watchbox Studios. I'm Tim. This is Monday Mailbag. Thanks for joining me. I can see we've already got friends joining us from around the world. PY7, Bruno G, Fjord Prefect, Simon Holt, welcome guys. I'm posting the link to our Bird Valle Horological Sculpture Giveaway so you guys can get started on that if you haven't already. And remember, if you post to our social media, subscribe to some of our social media screen, streams, you actually can wait your chances of winning this Bird Valle Horological Sculpture. Before I jump straight into that, let me remind you that there is no better place to have fun with watches than the watchbox.com. It's where I go to buy watches. I'm constantly scouring for that minute repeater, which will be mine. More on that in a moment. Of course, you can also see my videos without even leaving the page. Buy, trade, or sell. The best watches on the net, watchbox.com. All right, uh, real quick, Bird Valle Horological Sculpture. Some of you know of, of this. Some of you are seeing it for the first time. It is luscious lucite. It is a unique horological proposition. Parts that are taken from the watchmaker's bench once they've passed their effective service life. So rather than discarding them or scrapping them, they're given new life with a new sensibility. Modern art, and as you can see, beautifully rendered in lucite. The process used to create these skulls actually starts and ends about three weeks apart. So it's a long manual labor intensive process to create this retail $2,700 Bird Valle horological sculpture. For me, the most interesting part is that they actually autoclave it at hundreds of degrees for eight hours. So the process of constructing the skull, in some respects, similar to kiln-fired enamel or even carbon fiber. Okay, moving on, batting practice, guys. Thank you for joining me. From around the world, I can see Cleveland Dean joining in, Peter B. from Barcelona, Manny Manster. He's got to run, but he'll be right back. Watch Lover in Hawaii, longtime viewer in John GT3. John, you have excellent taste in cars. Let's jump into the program. Okay, Batting practice, warming up your monitor with my pitches and cuts. Okay, Stein V asking me, how much thinner is the new 50th anniversary Rolex Sea Dweller 43? Okay, the 126600, he's asking, how much thinner is it than the Deep Sea Sea Dweller? That's a great question. Okay, the Rolex Deep Sea Sea Dweller came out in 2008. It was reprofiled this year, but we're talking 2008 to 2017. It's a 44 millimeter watch. It's a colossal 17.8 millimeters thick because of the ring lock system, which is basically a vertical cylinder secured on the case back by titanium and on the front by a locking ring. So almost 18 millimeters thick and a colossal for Rolex, 55.6 millimeters lug to lug when you count the solid end links of the bracelet. Okay, so the Sea Dweller 43, the 50th anniversary on the 43 millimeters, but a world removed. This is a watch that's actually wearable on a normal wrist. So this one's 43 by 15.2 millimeters thick, much more wearable. And from lug to lug, a little bit more compact, but small differences make big differences in that 53.7 makes this a watch I could wear on my 16 centimeter wrist. I could not wear the deep sea. Okay. Subjectively speaking, this feels like a whole different world. This feels closer to the Submariner than it does to the deep sea in terms of wrist fit. So that's what you're working with, with this watch. Now, uh, as yet untested, the 2018 Deep Sea. It's got a new designation. It's got a new reference. It's a new watch in many respects. I haven't had a chance to measure this one and strap it onto the wrist, but you'll see wider bracelet links, uh, a more wearable profile to the case. The real change is in the profiling of the lugs and the width of the bracelet. So we'll find out if that makes a difference ergonomically when we get one in. Now, um, remember, a sub C, a current generation Rolex Submariner, so, you know, a 116610 is going to be 12.6 millimeters thick. And if you include the solid end links, about 51 millimeters extremity to extremity, lug to lug across the wrist. That's a much more wearable watch than any of these, but the Sea Dweller 43 takes a step away from the deep sea and towards the Submariner. Okay. Jose E. Tim, you've spoken about your preference for white metal watches. Would you ever accept colored gold on any watch? Yes, I would. Uh, I do find that there are some watches only offered in precious metal that are charismatic enough for me to make that jump. Despite the fact that I don't love colored gold, yellow or rose, I can tolerate in these. The Zenith Academy Georges Favre Jaco. This is a watch that came out in 2015, 45 millimeters, but a very wearable 45. Uh, again, closer to the Submariner than the Deep Sea. This is a watch 
made in 150 pieces for the 150th anniversary of Zenith. As you can see, it is exquisitely executed with a, a fusée. So you can see a fusée and mainspring barrel. The fusée and the mainspring barrel working like the gears of a bike. As the 50-hour power reserve discharges and the mainspring has less force, the fusée changes the gear ratio between the drivetrain and the barrel so that the force delivered to the escapement remains constant. Of course, this hikes the parts count to nearly a thousand, which I love. And the watch is handsome, extraordinary, beautifully made, beautifully proportioned, ergonomically outstanding, and a truly special episode in Zenith history. I would wear that in a heartbeat. Okay, Audemars Piguet Tourbillon, or as it's known to collectors, Tourbillon Automatique. This is a watch that came out in 1986, and it was probably the first serially produced wristwatch tourbillon ever. It was certainly the first serially produced automatic wristwatch tourbillon. They made between 350 and 390 of them. A tiny little watch, 32 and a half lug to lug, uh, only about five and a half millimeters thick. This was an extraordinary landmark watch. It actually had a bumper automatic movement. You can see the striker in platinum iridium through the little aperture at six o'clock. That's not a moon phase. That's actually the winding mass, and you can watch it bouncing back and forth. It featured a special etched titanium tourbillon cage created for the first time ever in the watch industry using a process pioneered in the microchip industry. This was a landmark watch in every sense, right down to the fact that they built the movement into the case back of the watch. So if you turn it over, you can actually see the jewels of the barrel and the drivetrain. This thing is monstrous. Not only would I wear it in colored gold, there is a platinum version available. I would actually prefer this watch in colored gold because as vintagey as it is in its outright dimensions, the yellow gold gives it just a little bit more punch and kick. And if you're wondering about the Sunray, the entire watch and boxed set was Egyptian themed with sun gods, Egyptian, uh, all sorts of Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was incredibly elaborate. It might have also been the first over-designed collector's boxed set in history. So, Jajero Lecoultre Reversal Repetition, 1994. Grand Thai case, about 25 and a half millimeters wide, 42 millimeters lug to lug. This was JLC's first ever wristwatch minute repeater. It was also one of the smallest wristwatch minute repeaters ever made as it had to fit in the rotating portion of a Grand Thai case. Eric Coudre, later of Cabistan, designing their multi-axial fusée tourbillon and the JLC gyro tourbillon. This was his first wholly managed project within JLC in 1994. Consulting work was also done for JLC by Audemars Piguet Renoé Papy to help to industrialize the production process and reportedly this was a watch of many firsts. This was the first Swiss wristwatch minute repeater that did not require the gongs to be treated with horse urine. Is that a little bit of urban legend? Possibly, but I love the story, so I'm throwing it in there. Yes, rose gold in spite of the yellow overtones that I just mentioned. I would wear that in a heartbeat. That's a special watch. Okay, finally, Vacheron Constantin, Saltarello, reference 43041. Yes, it looks like a bathroom scale, but what a beautiful sight to see in your bathroom every day. True, rose lathe guilloche dial in salmon with rose gold case, 200 of these made, jump hour and retrograde, extraordinary for the late 90s. You can see... An engraved and Geneva Hallmark blazon, Jager Lecoult based automatic calibers, the JLC caliber that you know from the Audemars Piguet Jumbo and the original version of the reference 3700 Patek Nautilus. There it is doing Vacheron duty, highly decorated, stamped with the Geneva Hallmark with a fully skeletonized and hand engraved rotor. Yes. That is not the rose gold version, but I would wear the rose gold version in a heartbeat. It has the same glorious case back. Okay. Great question, Jose. Moving on, Brett S. asks, thinking about a Patek Philippe 5196P, but I've never owned a manual wind watch, and I'm afraid that I'll overwind it and break it. Is this a real concern? Is this likely? No. The analogy here is you've given your dog a bath, you understand your dog, you understand the microwave, you know the risks. You're not going to put your dog in the microwave to dry it off. Knowing that you can damage a manual wind watch, and this, this watch uses a Patek Philippe 215 manual wind caliber, but knowing you can damage it by overwinding it, you're going to wait for the resistance to rise. If you've only ever grown up on automatic winding watches, and you can go deep into high horology as a sophisticated collector without ever having a manual wind watch, but if you've never experienced it, you 
you might wonder, am I actually going to break it? The resistance in any manual wind watch will rise steadily and predictably and noticeably before you get to the point that you're going to damage something. So as long as you don't wind it at a breakneck pace, expect 30 to 40 winds for this watch. You're going to feel increasing pressure. At that point, just stop. You're good. It will tell you when it's full. There's no dangerous that you're going to, there's no danger that you're going to snap your mainspring accidentally. Uh, it's, and I, I should say every modern manual wind watch should have some sort of slipping bridle mainspring. Grubel Forcey does it. It doesn't have to be that sort of thing. My Duomet has it. There are manual wind watches you cannot overwind. Oris does it. Oris does it at the $5,000 price point. Paddock, balls in your court. All right, moving on, Ezra G. My friend told me that Breitling dive watches cannot be water tested by, aut by most watchmakers' equipment. And is this true or false? No, it can be. There's an urban legend that you can't water test a Breitling dive watch with conventional equipment because a lot of times this equipment is calibrated to expect a certain amount of compression and decompression during the high pressure tests. Water testers typically do two tests. One is a high pressure, one is a low pressure. There are vacuum tests too. So the high pressure testing typically compresses the case, measures that compression in fractions of a millimeter, and then it expects the case to expand the same amount that it was compressed. That would be a healthy watch. That would be a solid bill of health, no leakage. The problem with a lot of Breitling cases and Breitling watches is that they need to be tested on a hard case setting with most of the water testing equipment. They have what's often termed an incompressible case, and, and this is good if you own a Breitling. It's a very solidly made watch, and it often will not deflect sufficiently for a water tester to measure it conventionally. Uh, just make sure your watchmaker knows to use an incompressible or hard case test. You'll have no problem. Okay, stay with me online when the broadcast ends. Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. I'd really appreciate it if you follow me. I'm trying to get 5,000 followers. I know small beans by the standards of watches on Instagram, but I feel like I have a high quality audience and I love the interaction that we get on my posts. I'm always posting, always responding. It's probably the easiest way to reach me directly and I update daily with some of the best, most colorful, three-dimensional, and I might even say visually loud watches. I want superheroes here, not necessarily the policemen walking the beat. I want these watches to be Superman, Batman, Iron Man. So yes, it's a little bit of an art project, but you'll love it. Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. Okay. Now, by the way, if you're watching this recorded, please comment below and subscribe. I'd appreciate that too. Okay, viewer mail and questions, Grail watches, Tantalum watches, Ulysse Norden freak. We've got a full deck tonight. Um, by the way, Question coming in from Edward Ledden of Sweden. Tim, what do you think of the Vacheron Constantin 1972? The, the 1972 Prestige, which was just discontinued, by the way, is one of my all-time favorite Vacheron references. The men's white gold 1972 Prestige made from 2013 to 2017 will probably be the first Vacheron I buy. It has a solid gold Geneva Hallmark ultra-thin movement, and although it looks unwieldy and unwearable, it's actually a very wearable watch on male wrists, it has a look and a wrist stance and a character second to none. I adore it. So you ask me what I think, I think it's my favorite modern Vacheron. Okay, continuing. Let's talk about the first question to land. Okay, Rodrigo I asks, Hi Tim, in your opinion, is there a set definition of a grail watch? Or if not, how would you define it? Okay, uh, hi Rodrigo, grail watch is one of the oldest terms kicking around the online watch community. It's been online as long as I've been online reading about watches, so since at least the late 90s. It's anything but standardized. By the way, I threw up a Patek Philippe, uh, you know, 5208P, because for many, this would be the definition of a grail, the unobtainable, the aspirational, the ultimate. But hold that thought. So unlike older terms from the early watch internet that have lapsed, such as watch idiot savant, no one really uses that anymore, and I'm kind of happy to see it die, or serials removed for sale, the old standard for gray market watches on the internet, again, rest in pieces. I don't miss that. Um, grail watch remains in circulation because it has positive connotations, and it inspires people's imagination, and it is good to dream. Uh, there are two questions to consider. First is 
is a grail watch a fixed destination? And second, is a grail watch supposed to be obtainable under any circumstances? Okay, so question one, is your grail a fixed destination? That is, do you have your grail and you either reach it or not? Or can it be a moving target? Okay, my experience, my original grail watch was the Jager Le Coult Dual Met chronograph in white gold. That's not mine, but that's one just like it, one of the 200. White gold, gorgeous caliber, a unique dual drive drain, dual power reserve, time and chronograph on two separate dials. I saw it in 2010. I was instantly in love. I spent four years saving, scrimping, pursuing, and learning to make that watch mine when I turned 30 in 2014. Once I had that watch, I had spent four years studying Jager Le Coult in depth. I had new horizons to pursue, and the Grand Memovox from 2001 to 2004 in platinum with blue dial became my new grail. That's me doing a just for fun review on my watch reviews channel of my own watch. I still adore this watch and there have been, uh, there's been at least one year since I bought this watch in late 2014 that it has been my most worn watch for the year. I try to wear this watch at least two days a week. Now, once I had that one, I had to really step back and think because I bought two Uber watches in one year. First, to save a little bit more money and second, to consider what could possibly be the sequel to this. So yes, I did acquire yet another grail and it took me, uh, again, a couple of years to save up and plan and find the right example of the Reverso Platinum Number no. 2 Torbion, which you guys have seen many times on these pixels. So you know that I attained three of my grails. I do believe personally that a grail should be a moving target, that you should have new horizons to pursue, new dreams to come true. I will say A Blog to Watch has had an entire series, and I highly recommend it, um, my first grail watch along these lines. As you can see, many people, not just grail watches, but their first grail watch, endorsing the notion that there will be and have been others. And if you do believe in in the one and only personal grail watch, that is the watch that you imagine as the thing that will truly close the book on collecting. You might believe in another term of art from the collecting community, the concept of the exit watch. This is often the watch, and that's the 5016A that wreaked havoc at only watch, a beautiful timepiece, but there are some who think that if you ever attain your grail and you can only ever have one grail, that's effectively it. You've reached your exit point to collecting. Now you just enjoy them. I don't believe in the idea of an exit watch because frankly, I can't stand the notion of closing the book, but some people do believe that you've got an exit watch and that is your grail watch. They're one and the same and you can only ever have one. Now, is the grail watch supposed to be obtainable under any circumstances? There are two schools of thought. Now, collectors debate this endlessly, impossibly, or to the limit of possibility. What is it? Is it impossible to attain your grail watch, something you'll always be chasing like a receding horizon? Or it is, is it something that's spectacular, but if you set your priorities, you plan, you save, and the right circumstances coincide, maybe you could attain it? Well, to illustrate, we need to consider Indiana Jones 3, art imitating life, featuring Harrison Ford and Sean Connery in a father-son role. Technically, they're both Henry Jones. Indiana is the younger, Henry Jones Sr. is the older man. Okay, so if you're not familiar, uh, Indiana Jones and his father are pursuing the Holy Grail. Initially in the movie, uh, Indiana Jones views the Grail as unobtainable, seeing it as more of an abstraction that worked as a metaphor for total self-possession or self-actualization, think Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or self-improvement. He didn't take it literally through most of the movie. Um, so, you know, curiously, obviously, he feels this way despite uh, the fact that in Raiders of the Lost Ark, when the Nazi dirt dig, uh, you know, kind of went south in a really big way, uh, I, I don't know how you could not believe in the supernatural at that point, but hey, he had his eyes closed. Maybe he missed the party. But that said, Henry Jones Sr., his father, views the grail literally. That is, he views the grail as an actual object that exists that can be obtained but requiring a diligent effort to attain. It's spectacular but can be earned given extraordinary commitment. So two different schools of thought. Indiana Jones is the unobtainable grail watch, the grail as an idea, a journey, but not a destination. And Henry Jones is the grail as obtainable and aspirational. So 
The Indiana Jones view of Grail watches holds that a personal Grail should be like a striving process. This is Indiana's philosophy. With no end, an aspiration that defines an ideal, a dream, and pushes you onward like that receding horizon that you will always chase but never capture. Okay, so in watch collecting terms, the Indiana Jones Grail watch is like having an unobtainable Grail, like a Steel Patek Philippe 5018 perpetual calendar chronograph from the 40s that sells for over $11 million at auction. Okay, and it's a path of collecting rather than a destination. So having this grail will propel you in your journey as a collector. Uh, you will start down the path into the world of Patek Philippe, collecting successively more ambitious watch purchases from a basic Calatrava up to perhaps a vintage Nautilus, uh, even complications, perpetual calendars and chronographs, but never including this, never achieving the grail. Now, I will say the Henry Jones view of grails is uh, the limit of possibility. It's something that can be earned with an extraordinary effort. It's one that I choose personally. This is how I envision the grail watch, something that you can obtain. Uh, I need to live in the realm of hope and possibility, and my mind reels at the futility of an unobtainable goal. I just don't like the idea. For me, motivation derives from attainable goals and surmountable challenges. So, for instance, the JLC, Shishir Lukul Master minute repeater that we first saw in 2005 and this titanium version in 2006. That is my grail and I embrace the combination of planning, sacrifice, and yes, good luck, the right watch at the right time that will be necessary to get there. Now, perhaps this is my American sensibility showing through, uh, the American in me speaking, because I find that we thrive on optimism as a people and if you're British, you might prefer the Indiana Jones approach of the unobtainable grail. Uh, given your preference for the unfathomably dark and hopeless version of The Office. Uh, believe it or not, this was actually a funny show in the United States. I saw the British version. I wanted to cry. Guys, I don't know how you do it, but I salute you. If this is how you laugh, I don't know, but you've got a sturdy soul. No wonder you're the British Bulldog. I prefer the version with Steve Carell. That's just me. I'm an American. I need some hope. Now, I will also say that I would advise most collectors to adopt my position that the Grail is an attainable watch uh, simply because dreams without hope often are called nightmares, and I would avoid that. I think it's best to have a chance to wear your Grail watch at some point in your life and not feel deprived. Okay, comment and subscribe if you're watching this recorded. Uh, I will say this. Uh, Dimitri K. has a fantastic question, and this is one that I absolutely love. But if we can go back to the beginning, guys, can you call up my wrist shots? Because I totally skipped them all, and I want to give a shout-out to some of our friends in cyberspace. Okay, so wrist shots. Win H. is my man. After my own heart, with a mountain bike featuring plenty of Envy composite components, and his Ulysse Norden Marine Annual Calendar Chronograph. Uh, Fernando G. actually stopped by, and I shook his hand today. He stopped by our shop today to collect his AP Bumblebee in forged carbon with ceramic bezel. Wonderful discontinued Royal Oak Offshore. Craig E. is bundled for the cold in Solden, Austria's Ice Q Cafe with his Rolex Deep Sea. This, by the way, is where they filmed the ski scene in Bond Spectre. And finally, frosty themes continue with Jatandra K.'s Speedy Tuesday, Project Alaska 3 tribute, and his Audi Q7 all-wheel drive. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch is right here. Okay, jumping back to Dimitri K. Okay, so Dimitri K. asks, Hi Tim, I've tried the FP Journe Chronomet Bleu and I'm hooked on this metal tantalum. I, I love the look, the color, the rarity, the weight of it, but I'm looking at CB prices pre-owned as well as dealer wait lists to buy it new, and I don't think this is going to happen for me. I'm impatient and a bit underfunded to buy it pre-owned. What alternatives do I have? Well, the Panerai PAM-172, it's a Luminor Marina. The PAM-172 came out in 2003. They made 300 pieces, manual wind chronometer, tantalum case, scintillating combination of blue hands, black dial, tantalum case, I would recommend that, or I would recommend you find a Panerai PAM-192 Luminor Chronograph, 300 pieces of this from 2004, also a limited edition special series. From 2006, the Gerald Genta Arena by Retro. If one of these ever shows up in white gold, guys, 
and that's it right there. With green dial accents, I will probably break my JLC vow, my JLC only vow, and buy that thing. 45 millimeters, but very wearable. Tantalum bezel in a white gold case with a gorgeous coined edge. It's a Breguet if Breguet had a sense of humor. Double retrograde, minutes and the date with a jump hour. Okay, there's also a rose gold model. Be forewarned. AP Royal Oak 14790, a mid-sized Royal Oak from the late 80s, early 90s, mostly tantalum, a few rose gold accents, JLC movement inside. I love it. And if you want to go with a Royal Oak Offshore reference 2682 TK, this is going to be more expensive than a CB, but you won't have to wait for it. They're available now. This is the famed Orchard Road. It was a Singapore boutique special edition from 2008, uh, wonderfully hefty with rubber bezel and all in tantalum, 100 pieces made, totally sensational. That's one for the ages. Finally, Hublot Big Bang Tantalum. It's out there, available for immediate delivery pre-owned. Many examples, ready to purchase at any time. And finally, believe it or not, Weiler, Genève, created a couple of chronographs in 2008 and 2009 of 88 pieces and 192 pieces. That's the 88. That's the 182. Pardon me, not 192. 182. That was a Dakar Rally limited edition. 53 millimeters lug to lug by about... Uh, 42 across. A big watch, but wearable, and all in tantalum. It weighs a ton. Dimitri, watches after your own heart. You will enjoy all of these. To be sure, more exist, but this is a start. Okay, friends, here we have a great question from Saeed A., who's asking me, Tim, is the Ulysse Norden Freak a tourbillon watch or not? I see so many confusing answers and claims online. All right. The 2000, this is a great question because there are two answers, not one, and it does get confusing. Let's start with the basics and the beginning of this tale. The original 2001 Ulysse Norden Freak, and that's actually the later Blue Phantom, but it works the same way, um, is not a tourbillon. It is what's known as a carousel movement. The carousel movement was a more rugged take on Breguet's historic tourbillon, but invented almost 100 years later in 1892 by Danish watchmaker uh, Bonne Bonnickson. And we actually have a picture of Bonne right here. And he invented the carousel. And that is what a carousel looks like. Now, if we go back to the UN Freak of 2001, the very first, the UN Freak 2001... Or at least, well, that's the blue phantom again, but you get the idea. You can see that the movement is housed entirely at the center of the dial. Here's where a carousel, there it is. There's the true 2001 freak. Here's where a carousel is different from a tourbillon. It has two separate powertrains and drivetrains. One to provide energy to the escapement to run the tourbillon, or rather to run the escapement, and one to move the carousel. So you have a drivetrain and a power source to move the carousel, that is the whole body of the movement. And then you have a separate powertrain to run the escapement. This is why on the Freak, you can turn the bezel around and you don't crash the escapement. It's not coupled to the same drivetrain that is moving that baguette movement, that carousel around. By creating the two different drivetrains, you can move this thing. It's also a lot more shock resistant and rugged than a tourbillon. That was Bonnickson's idea. You had a more wristwatch specific, or I shouldn't say wristwatch specific, but a more rugged alternative than the pocket watch tourbillon. In invented by Breguet. So this was a tougher alternative to the tourbillon that basically did the same thing, rotating the escapement with respect to gravity to even out the effects of fast running and slow running. Now, moving on, Blancpain actually added its own carousel in 2008. That is the Blancpain carousel of 2008, designed with help of Vincent Calabrese. Uh, Blancpain combined both escapements, a true tourbillon and a carousel, with the 2013 tourbillon carousel. Literally both connected by a differential to even each other out. Now, here's where things get a little confusing. The Freak Diavolo of 2010, the Freak Diavolo of 2010 combined both a tourbillon and a carousel. So you can see the escapement is a tourbillon on top of the carousel. So at that point with the Diavolo, the Freak became a tourbillon and a carousel. Moreover, uh, I can say this is interesting because the carousel can be purchased relatively cheaply. Not cheap, but Peter Barcelona will sell you an AHCI Luminaries own carousel for only 6,450 euro, and you can get it in gold for 7,250 euro. That's Anaceto Jimenez and his son Daniel at Peter Barcelona. Yes, 
he is an AHCI member, just like Carrie, just like Philippe Dufour, just like F.P. Jorn and Marco Lang, and you can buy his watch for under $10,000 U.S. dollars. He'll even make it in titanium or bronze if you prefer. So great options there. Now, here we have some questions coming through. Uh, Tim, what are your thoughts on the Peter Carousel from David Lemieux? David, I would buy it. It's that simple. It's an incredible opportunity to get into true high horology uh, from a company that makes, you know, a few dozen watches a year and have a one-for-one -one personal relationship with your watchmaker and even exchange Christmas cards. Awesome stuff. Okay, more questions. JBO Surf of Australia, Adelaide, I believe, saying, Tim, is it possible to buy a Laurent Ferrier for around the same money as the FP Journe Chronomet Bleu currently is going for? I would say if you budget $30,000, yeah, you could easily buy yourself a Laurent Ferrier micro rotor with the double direct impulse escapement. You'd get one of the steel ones. I would recommend the Ice Blue Sunburst in steel Galet micro rotor or consider the Boreal, which is almost like Laurent Ferrier's sports watch with the fully loomed dial and hands. You could pick those both up, I believe, for around thirty dollars to $35,000 pre-owned, which is the going rate for a lot of Chronomet Bleu on the pre-owned circuit today. Okay, so also, wrist shots. I asked, you answered. Casper has the all the time in the world, thanks to a rare Vacheron Constantin overseas perpetual calendar. I actually asked specifically for someone to send me a wrist shot of this watch if they had it. He's got it in glorious rose gold and immaculate couture, an excellent combination. As you can see, it does fit under a dress cuff. Okay, Ray B notes that every collection should contain a Casio G-Shock, and he obliges me. Thank you right there, sharing the Casio G-Shock DW5000. This year, 35 years young, that was the original Casio G-Shock reference. And you can see he's doing some yard work in the background, a man after my own heart, and after G-Shocks. Now, Ty F just welcomed his Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter back from service. Love that polished and lacquer filled bezel. A little take variation on the Bond watch and one I happen to adore. And thanks to Mark B, whose epic collection allows us to finish with a flourish tonight. Wow, how many weightlisted Rolex Grail sports watches do you have there? You have a Sky Dweller. You have a black and blue GMT. You've got a, a steel ceramic Daytona. My goodness, my man, you've got one of everything. Although, if I had to pick one, it would be that Reverso off to the upper right. I love the Reverso calendar. Lovely piece. And... Excellent taste in rose gold. Geophysic deadbeat second world time. My hat is off to you, or I should say, my hat surrogate. Everyone, thank you for joining me tonight. I think, let me see if I can take one question from the live chat tonight. Dylan Abel, looking for a do-it-all Swiss, entry-level Swiss watch, black dial. What do you recommend? Well, first of all, there are many Grand Seiko spring drive options that fit that description with 100 meter water resistance and loomed dial that I would recommend you consider. All of that said, all of that said, I would say you want to consider the new Oyster Perpetual with black dial. There is a new black dial Oyster Perpetual out this year that you're going to want to consider. I want to say it is, I want to say it's the 114300 reference with black dial. That needs to be considered for 5700 US dollars. If you don't need to get wet, I recommend the Chichero LeCoult Master Control with black dial. That is far more luxuriously appointed than the sector dial variant. I prefer that one. I would also say you may want to consider the Omega Seamaster Railmaster that you mentioned came out last year. Get it with the black dial, get it on the bracelet. A fantastic watch at any price point. And finally, I would also recommend that you consider looking at a older Zenith El Primero Caliber 410 Complete Calendar. Get the Zenith Chronomaster El Primero Caliber 410 Complete Calendar with COSC certificate. They made those from the mid-1990s to early 2000s, about 2001 with a COSC cert. That would be my pick of all of those. All right, guys, thank you for joining me. Everyone who chimed in, everyone who sounded off in the chat, everyone who subscribed and liked and joined me at Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. Remember, if you're watching this recorded, there's a link in the description box so you can join the giveaway raffle for our bird a horological sculpture. I'm Tim, this is the Watchbox, and thanks for logging on.